What is going on guys, Jimmo here again, and today we're going to be doing something a little different, taking a stroll down memory lane, looking at some of the older videos, well just one older video today, that uh, the first one I ever launched, how to paint your car yourself, which is a lot different than the videos I'm putting out now, it was just kind of like a silent film, you get text there, not too much description, and I had a lot of complaints from people that they didn't really get much out of it, so... I'm going to try to uh, remedy that now and uh, we'll go over, it, go over it a little bit more in depth and I'll break it down. So let's get into it, roll the film and I'll give you guys a little bit more direction on what was done. Okay, so what you'll see me do a lot of the time on this job is sand the car down. So you sand for multiple reasons. Most of the time you're sanding to remove imperfections or to create some sort of adhesion. So the sanding will clean and abrade the surface so that your paint falls into the scratch and adheres to the panel. And uh, that's kind of the main principle for sanding. And that's sort of what I'm doing here. I'm sanding to remove the paint because what we're going to be doing is fixing a dent, applying a little bit of body filler, and getting it all prepped, that whole panel ready for paint. So I have some filler on my board here, mixing it up. Uh, you want to do it in a kind of downward sweeping action so you're squeezing out any air pockets that might be uh, introduced to the mix as you're stirring up your filler. So back to the sanding so I removed the paint there to allow my filler to go over bare metal and a scratch I used 80 grit paper now 80 grit on metal is a little bit different than 80 grit on paint because uh, the metal is a lot harder so it doesn't scratch as deep as it does in paint so it's acceptable for that part here, but you should go over with something finer, like some 120 even. Might have been not a bad idea here. So there we go. I'm going to gradually fill in this dent. So you want to do it with multiple coats rather than one blob or else you'll get a bunch of pinholes in it. So um, I'm going to just keep, keep taking a bit and putting it on there. So after that cures, after about 5-10 minutes, it is time to sand it down with a block. So when I start sanding, I usually go with something a little coarser and gradually work my way to a finer grit. So I'm going to start off probably with um, some 80 or 120 here. And you want to kind of go multi-directionally. So keep coming at it from different angles. And it's better if you can take longer strokes, but when you want to keep your blend space small, you kind of need to... Uh, reduce the size and length of the strokes with the block because you want to keep your scratches, all the core scratches, in a very small area. So that's why I'm kind of keeping it smaller here. But the general idea is you're just leveling it out with the surrounding area. And uh, that's what we're doing. And I, of course, had some people complaining that I didn't remove the bumper. It is actually dropped, so I've unbolted it and kind of shoved it away from the body so I can get in there and sand it afterwards. Um, so yeah, we're going to keep blocking until it's ready to go. Sometimes you can get this on the first try. So if you don't, then you need to apply more filler and repeat the process until it is feeling level. You don't feel the dent anymore. So, I mean, you get better with experience. I don't really remember what or how many applications I needed on this. It might have just been the one, but uh, I honestly, I can't remember. This was about four or five years ago. And I really liked this video because it, you know, the quality isn't the greatest, but it illustrates best all of the steps kind of and principles required to refinish a panel. So, I mean, it's good for guys that are maybe stepping into the trade or maybe the weekend warriors that kind of want to understand the principles and the core things involved for simple refinish jobs. Now, it's also the best practice to try and keep it on the metal. You can feather this stuff into OEM paint. And when I say feathering, I was talking about feathering the filler into the paint. Uh, it's best to do it on metal, but it can be done over paint, just with the finishing putty, that is. You don't want to use a heavy-duty filler when you're doing bigger dents. So this portion of the feathering is feathering out the paint layer. So you have a whole bunch of different paint layers that are kind of merged together and create a line that you can feel when you run your hand over. So if you gradually pull them apart, you can do it by hand with a block or with the sander. I know I shouldn't really be angling. You want to kind of keep it straight and gradually pull apart the layers until you have about a quarter inch in between, quarter to half inch. Next comes back sanding, and back sanding is just to give us enough room for our primer to land. So we want to prime over all of the core scratches that our block created, which were 120 scratches around that area. So our primer is going to go a little bit beyond there, and it has to land on a sanded surface. 
So sanding the surrounding area with 320 allows for that. So it's really just a preparation step for your primer. Next I'm going to mask it up, give it a quick little tear job. I like doing this for little prime spots. Just hang a big piece on and rip it out. I find it pretty quick. And then I'll hang a few little pieces of tape. And you don't want to prime to an edge. So you want to give yourself enough room because if you prime all the way to a line and you have a hard line of primer, when you go to block that afterwards, a lot of the time it might feel like it's leveled out. On darker colors especially, you're going to see it afterwards. You're going to look down the panel and you're going to see a big line where you taped off your primer. So you want to give yourself room to prime and not bring your primer all the way to where you've masked it off. Now there's all kinds of different primers that you can use in this specific scenario, but the bare metal usually needs a separate primer. I believe I used a direct to metal urethane primer. I'm going to know in a second when I start watching the rest of this, but for bare metal you need to either have um, an etch or an epoxy on it or use a direct to metal, which this must be because uh, that's it looks like I have a urethane primer coming up. So uh, usually the urethane direct to metals are okay for small areas of bare metal. So you want to start big and gradually come in. So go as far as you think you need to on the first coat and gradually come in. Um, I know it's kind of a reverse for a lot of the guys maybe shaking their head saying, no, no, that's you got it backwards. Back in the day, they used to re recommend starting small and, and going out further. But now uh, I've been told by multiple sources that it can lead to sinking problems down the road because your primer is sitting on top of overspray. And when you're priming, you need to give each coat some flash time. So it'll go, it lets the solvent escape. It goes from like a wet look to a matte. And then you know you're ready for another coat. So it takes about, well, it depends on the primer. You can take anywhere from an hour to a day for it to cure. You have to look at the tech sheet for the specific primer you're using. So what I just applied there is guide coat. This was a graphite powder. Now you can actually just use paint if you prefer. All it is is a visu visual indication for you when you're sanding. So I'm going to block sand here starting off with some 320 grit paper. And uh, when the black powder goes away, I know that I've leveled out the area. So it's just a visual thing. Uh, sometimes you don't even use it. And you can use it as you gradually refine the scratch. So I'm going to have to go over it with something finer afterwards. I can guide coat it again. I'm not sure if I do. I'll find out after. And that'll kind of sit in the scratches. And once you see it all disappear, you know you've taken your 320 scratch and turned it into a 600 or whatever the case may be. And you can do this wet or dry. You can do pretty well, well, not anything. Anything after it's primed, you can do wet or dry interchangeably. You don't want a wet sand filler because it'll absorb the absorb the water. That wouldn't be good. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's just personal preference. Water sanding keeps the dust down. It doesn't really make that big of a difference as long as it's sanded in one shape or another machine hand it doesn't really matter but you want to block sand any area afterwards just to kind of level out that levels out more of the feathering and any imperfections you might have had in the dent as well so here i am wet sanding uh i think i'm using probably some 600 grit paper and i need to go over both my dent and the surrounding 320 scratches remember from when we back sanded earlier because we wanted to keep our primer inside that back mask sanding. Now we're going to change that from a 320 to a 600 because base coat doesn't have a lot of fill to it. And you can't really fill a 320 scratch with paint. So it'll show, especially on a silver car. So you need to finish it off in usually a 600. You check the paint with the paint line you're using. Generally it's a 600. Some might be 8 or something around there, but uh, it needs to be a lot finer than 320. So I usually start off with a block even over my primer, like I'll try to keep using a block the whole way to make sure that any slight imperfections are taken care of. And then in the areas that had no, nothing done to them, you go over by hand. Uh, it's a little bit better if you have like a wet block, like the kind of contours to the surface. It's a little better on your hands and it prevents getting any finger marks on your panel as well. But uh, that's not really an issue on this one. Oh, I have a dedicated chapter to sanding primer over spray. So that's uh, yeah, that's what I was talking about with the where I back sanded earlier. Uh, well, I guess I'm taking off the overspray as well and uh, taking turning that 320 into a 600. Maybe I use something even finer here. You would have had to go over the 320 first with some 600. I might refine that a little bit further just to kind of recover some blend space, so I have more of the panel to use when I want to blend my color across it afterwards. But uh, right here, I think I'm using some 600. 
And the next thing I'm going to be doing is preparing my blend panel. Now you can do this a number of different ways. In recent years, I've come to really like the new 3M finishing discs. They have like 1500 or 1200 grit finishing discs that you can put on the sander and just go over the entire, entire panel by machine. And I think those are, yeah, I think that's just the ultimate way to do it. And then you can scuff your edges up afterwards. Uh, the pasting method isn't terrible either. I like uh, I like it because it cleans it a lot better. And uh, I don't know, I just liked it for some reason. I still don't mind the pasting method. I have a gold pad with a sanding paste, which is kind of like the concept of shaving with shaving cream. And, you know, the cream keeps the razor sharp. So same idea, the sanding paste is kind of like a lubricant that keeps the pad cutting uh, well and it also cleans it and the RM stuff the one I'm using 851 I don't even know if they still make it or what but it actually has like a mild acid in it that's supposed to be uh, good for adhesion I'm informed by my BASF rep but uh, like I say you can do this a number of different ways you can even just go over it with some 1500 wet sandpaper by hand and generally you want to scuff up your edges again with the pad after because you don't want to cut through an edge in a blend panel so if you're sanding that edge right near where I'm at right now at the front of the quarter panel if I was using some 1200 grit paper there's a chance that I can cut through the edge really quick and then that's going to require color and if that required color I'd have to take my color into the door to blend to get a perfect match and with keeping this video as basic as possible for people whenever you're whenever you have color close to an edge you need to blend it into the next panel because the colors are not identical the ones you mix and spray compared to what's on the car you can check out some other videos I have on that if you want to learn more about color differences but I thought I would just make mention of it in this case what I'm gonna be doing is blending the color within that quarter panel and you might ask why aren't I going into the bumper generally bumpers are slightly off color anyway and we're gonna just take our chances on this one but if you had a quarter not matching a door then it's not gonna look right at all so uh, that's what we are doing and you can see this uh, this job actually some background it's my sister-in-law's car that uh, I did specifically for a demo I asked her I said I need to fix something I wanted to do a video this is my first one ever and you can see there's damage on the bumper that uh, that I just ignored but uh, anyway let's get on to the next step applying a sealer so this is sort of an optional step in most lines um, I don't think I really needed it here I just kinda wanted to show it it's basically a primer that gives you a little bit better of a foundation for your paint so it improves the quality a little bit in some cases I don't think it really had much of an impact here but uh, uh, you can check out some other videos too if you wanted to learn more about primer sealers and when there's a when there's a better time to use them now the orientation code seems to throw a lot of people off now especially with my new waterborne videos and I have the wet bed this one here is a solvent based toner from the paint line it's just a binder that will fill in the scratches it's clear and that's just kind of get rid of all the micro scratches so when I'm blending my silver they don't my metallics don't get caught inside those little scratches from earlier and stand up funny and you know become visible so that's the purpose of an orientation coat whenever you're blending a high metallic especially a light color it's a really good idea to use that okay so I'm using BSF's RM Diamond which is a pretty good solvent you can see it covers pretty well Putting it on medium, a little light, but not not too light. You got to put it on, but you don't want to crank it soaking on. And uh, what do I got there? It looks like my Iwata. I used the Develbus GTI for the sealer. I got my Iwata, and I'm trying to keep my blend as you know as, as so far away from that door as possible. But I need to take it out a little bit further each time. So you can see I'm fanning it out a little bit as I go. Um, and that's basically you want to get gradually further and further now this one here I'm gonna pull back and drop my pressure a bit and blend it out and that's just gonna even out the metallics even out my blend and I did get a little bit close to the door there I might have hit it near the top and changed the color slightly you want to try and avoid that uh, the clear fist coat that's uh, everybody's favorite spelling here to point out but uh, anyway so I'm gonna go over it here I got my developers GTI or plus I can't remember exactly which one so when you're spraying clear it has to go on the best analogy I've ever come up with is like spraying hot wax so as you're spraying it it's drying and you need to keep it going on wet or else you're gonna have you know clumps all over the place so you only have so much time based on your hardener 
or the speed of your clear and so you pick the hardener based on both the job size and the temperature so this one I'm using a fairly quick clear because I don't need a lot of time and uh, you know that's that's kinda it's something you learn as you go it's tough to really describe but uh, you need to kinda spray this stuff before you really grasp what I'm talking about so my second coat I'm gonna go around the offsets first and then just color it in sort of uh, I gotta do a little trick spray around my spoiler that I got popped up there and uh, you you're, when you have your second coat on it should pretty well look the way you want it once it's done and unfortunately I don't really have a finished shot of this I recorded one like three years ago before she sold it and uh, I was gonna give you guys an update but I'm pretty sure I lost that footage so I apologize uh, if I do find it I will be sure to post it so you guys can all see what it looked like before she got rid of it so that's gonna be it guys I hope you enjoyed this and hopefully I'll get a few more videos out similar that they can provide a little bit more detail on how they were accomplished in the prep because a lot of this stuff was based on solvent which I don't have and I know a lot of people are still spraying in the areas that the VOC mandates allow for it. So uh, I'll get some more out there. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook because you know I love when you do that. Uh, give us a like and subscribe here. So till next time, keep your stick on the ice. Later. <laughs>